Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Continue in the fourth canto, chapter 23, entitled Maharaj Pritu's Going Back Home, text 36. Vichayam Vimuko, Raja, Shrutvaitat, Apiyati, Yan, Balim, Tasmai, Haranti, Agre, Rajanaha, Pritave, Yata, Vijaya Bhimukho Raja, Vijaya Bhimukho Raja, Vijaya Bhimukho Raja, Shrutvaitat Abhyatiyan, Shrutvaitat Abhyatiyan, Shrutvaitat Palim tas mai harantya kre Palim tas mai harantya kre Palim tas mai harantya kre Rachana pritave yata Rachana pritave yata Vijaya bhimukho raja Shrutvaitat apiyatiyan Palim tas mai harantya kre Rachana pritave yata Vijaya bhimukho raja Vijaya bhimukho raja Vaishnavis Vijaya Bhimu Koraja Shudvaita Tabiyatiyan Padinta Smaya Harantya Kre Rajana Prita Vyata Vijaya Bhimu Koraja Shrutvaita Tabiyatiyan Malinta Smaya Harantya Kre Rajana Prita Vyata Vijaya Abhimukha One who is about to start For victory Raja King Shrutva Hearing Etat This Abhiyati Starts Yan On the chariot Balim Taxes Tasmai unto him Haranti present Agre before Rajanaha other kings Pritave unto King Pritu Yata as it was done Translation Purpose Ryan Grace Shri Prabhupada Shri Prabhupada Ki if a king who is desirous of attaining victory and ruling power chants the narration of Prithu Maharaj three times before going forth on his chariot, all subordinate kings will automatically render all kinds of taxes unto him as they rendered them unto Maharaj Prithu simply upon his order. Purport. 
Since the Kshatriya king naturally desires to rule the world, he wishes to make all other kings subordinate to him. This was also the position many years ago when Prita Maharaj was ruling over the earth. At that time, he was the only emperor on this planet. Even 5,000 years ago, Maharaj Yudhishthir and Maharaj Parikshit were the sole emperors of this planet. Sometimes the subordinate kings rebelled and it was necessary for the emperor to go and chastise them. This process of chanting the narrations of the life and character of Prita Maharaj is recommended for conquering kings if they want to fulfill their desire to rule the world. Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Gnandana Shalakaya Jakshuram Militam Yenatasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manovishtam Stapitam Yenabhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Yandarati Svabhantikam Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Arveda Agaradha Shiva Sari Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vagisha Yasya Vadane Lakshmi Yasya Chabakshasi Yasya Te Ridaye Samvit Tam Narasimham Maham Vajay Paralada Rida Yaladam Bhakta Vitya Vidaram Sharatindu Rajam Vande Parintra Vandanam Harim If a king who is desirous of attaining victory and ruling power chants the narration of Prita Maharaj three times before going forth on his chariot, all subordinate kings will automatically render all kinds of taxes unto him, as they render them unto Maharaj Prithu simply upon his order. When I first received um, the verse in purple, I was just wondering what am I supposed <laughs> to say in that purple? Um, then I thought of the newly crowned King Charles of England, who oh, in the mature age of 73 <laughs> enters the throne and thought perhaps he might be interested in that verse and purport. <laughs> perhaps he has a desire to re-establish the British Empire and might want to give it a go and chant the narrations of King Pritu before mounting his Royce Royce and um, heading out to, to politics. He has ancient, ancient times uh, where kings were like still doing the battles themselves. I find an interesting aspect to look upon. Sri Prabhupada sometimes, in regards to such narrations, points out how the political leaders nowadays are practically cowards, not capable to fight the fights they start. And they send all kinds of soldiers, and people, but they themselves are in some safe rooms and hidden, uh, like covered by so many bodyguards, because they're not even capable of fight. You know. So Kshatriya actually means capable to protect Kshatas, the herd and Triya to protect from. So actually Kshatriya should be able to be himself also um, fighting. Um, one thing is um, the desire to rule the world. Um, it's often something that is not very much glorified actually. <laughs> is one of the big problems is that conditioned souls have. That they think, yes, world is mine, I'm about to rule and own it. We have personalities who not uh, only go for the earth, but the whole universe. Srimad Bhagavatam describes personalities like Bali Maharaj, who had a desire to rule over the whole universe, or like Hiranyakashipu, and they managed to do so for a while. But as also here the purport says, you will never be uh, how do you say, uncontested, there will always be others who want your position. So it's not once attained you have it and you stay there, once obtained you have con constantly defended. Um, you will always have many enemies who want the position of rulership. So it's actually not desirable to become a king like this, <laughs> because you have to struggle a lot. We can also see that in, the, in smaller scales, people who rise to a certain position of influence or power, they have um, a lot of enemies also, or at least people who are envious of them. You know, so. so therefore it's discouraged actually to have too much of material ambitions um, because it comes along with a lot of undesirable suffering. Um, I was thinking more of conquering in regards to 
our little, uh, how to say, space of influence, the Bhagavad Gita describes, or, like, or Krishna uses the analogy in the Bhagavad Gita of the body being like a city with nine gates. And a Kshatriya can be also small. A Kshatriya is considered also someone who rules over a village, for example. It's not only the emperors, the big Kshatriyas. And also we, as opposed to become rulers over our own city with the nine gates. Like the nine gates are the, the senses, you know, all the acquiring senses, working senses. And it said someone who is really capable <coughs> of ruling over the city is called a Maharaj, a great king. This title Maharaj as is often or mostly applied to the sannyasis, uh, also out of the reason that they are expected to perfectly control their senses, mind, body, mind and senses. So, and the means to that conquest is important. How do I become successful in this battle? You know. Um, what weapons or weaponry do I use? What kind of methodology do I use in order to attain that goal, in order to be a conqueror of one's own city? And I think also Lucas likes to chant before the Bhagavatam starts one shloka that actually highlights how the Srimad Bhagavatam is our means to victory. You know, um, in Srimad Bhagavatam 1 to 4, we find Famous shloka Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Jaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasvatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Udhirayet The word Jayam is very significant because it means uh, means of conquest. The verse goes, before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead Narayana, unto Nara Narayana Rishi, the supermost human being, and Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and Antu Vyasadev, the author. So actually, it's a very similar thing we hear here in this verse, that the narrations of King Pritu is, is the powerful weapon, actually, that makes a king successful if he wants to conquer the world. If he goes on his chariot in three times, so it takes a while until he gets to start with his chariot, <laughs> <laughs> he has to go there and three times chant the narrations of King Pritu before he actually enters the battle. That will make him successful. One could also ask, but what if many kings at the same time have this idea? Who, who is going to win? <laughs> Would be maybe interesting to see. Um, but yes, it is encouraged. And like also here, the Bhagavatam starts with, in a, here this was in a broader sense, a means of conquest. And Sri Prabhupada in the purport writes, all the Vedic literatures and the Puranas are meant for conquering the darkest region of material existence. The living being is in the state of forgetfulness of his relation with God due to his being overly attracted to material sense gratification from time immemorial. His struggle for existence in the material world is perpetual and it is not possible for him to get out of it by making plans. If he at all wants to conquer the perpetual struggle for existence, he must re-establish his eternal relation with God. And one who wants to adopt such remedial measures must take shelter of literatures such as the Vedas and the Puranas. So we are about to, or the, the task is to conquer the ignorance that we are um, affected by. Mm -hmm. As we chanted in the beginning, Om Agyana Timirandasya, we are born already in dark ignorance, we don't know about ourselves. And just yesterday also, um, in some um, very uh, yeah, deeper conversation also with Damodar Prasad, where we talked also about this, what do we really know about ourselves? How do we, you know, what tangible perception do we actually have? And often we find, mm, we still wait for it, <laughs> that we actually have a tangible perception of the true self, that what we call the transcendental self. We have a sense of our minds, the layers of our minds, and perhaps we can perceive the ego with its identities. But the true, the, the I that perceives all that still remains a mystery. Also in, in psychology and whatever, you ask, go and ask some psychologists, psychiatrists and whatever, what do you think is the self? They might have some hypothesis, but at the end they will not be able to give an answer, because the established opinion is it cannot even be grasped. And it's true. By empirical means, no. Yeah. And the Bhagavatam establishes, but with the spiritual process, it can be revealed to you. 
but this is not very attractive to people with a mindset of empiricism because that goes completely beyond the limitations of this framework. So, but it's here to said the re-establishment um, re of one's relationship with God, which includes one's realization of the self, is being is a, is being uh, attained by um, taking shelter of the Vedic scriptures and studying this knowledge. And also, it matters how we apply it. As we said with, before with the weapon, a weapon, you must be able to wield it. Even if you talk about the sword of knowledge, if you just have a weapon and you don't know how to use it, you rather harm yourself instead of being able to defend yourself or to speak of attacking someone. You know this perfectly well. <laughs> um, and there are clear instructions that I would like to share with you, that from, in particular in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, where our prime guru, actually Brahma, beginning of our Sampradaya, gives instructions, but we also Srila Prabhupada gives a lot of very important uh, instructions on how to apply this um, means of conquest of Srimad Bhagavatam. And in 2753, um, it is, I skipped uh, Sanskrit. Uh, it said, the Lord's, uh, Brahma is speaking, the Lord's activities in association with his different energies should be described, appreciated, and heard in accordance with the teachings of the Supreme Lord. If this is done regularly with devotion and respect, one is sure to get out the illusory energy of the Lord. So that's the declared goal, to get out of the ignorance, out of the darkness. And here, Sri Prabhupada in this purpose says, the science of learning a subject matter seriously is different from the sentiments of fanatics. Fanatics or fools may consider the Lord's activity, activities in relation with the external energy to be useless for them, and they may falsely claim to be higher participants in the internal energy of the Lord. But factually, the Lord's activities in relation with his external energy and the internal energy are equally good. On the other hand, those who are not completely free from the clutches of the Lord's external energy should devoutly hear regularly about the activities of the Lord in relation with the external energy. So he speaks about um, Shrishti Lila, the pastime of creation. How does Krishna performs the act of creation, the maintenance, the solution? What is our relationship with this world? What are the Purusha avatars and so on? So, Important, I find, like he says, on the other hand, those who are not completely free from the clutches of the Lord's external energy should. So it said, like, the condition we are in determines for what kind of knowledge or pastimes we are fit. And this will be described, at least in the second canto, many statements go on that to say, okay, if you examine yourself and you see I'm very much influenced by material nature, by my false ego, bodily identification, urges, illusion, sleep, and so on, then I'm not fit for hearing about confidential pastimes of the Lord, for example. But the described or like prescribed medicine would be hearing about these pastimes related to this very energy I'm influenced by. Because this is important, like this pastime, the Shrishti leader, the creation pastime, is very, uh, we are participants in that. Right now, we are in the middle of the Shrishti, in the in the creation. We have we are embodied living beings. The Paramatma, <coughs> Vishnu feature is accompanying us, governing us. The time factor is there. Um, all this is there, and we are in the middle of it. And the problem is, we often are like very ignorant about how all this works. And we are bewildered. <laughs> um, but to our relief, I'm sure Dev Goswami says the material energy cannot be even fully understood by a pure devotee because only the Lord himself can fully comprehend. But we can to some degree, of course, create an understanding <coughs> with the aim that this leads us out of the illusion. What is the core illusion? That I take the identities I adopt as being mine. I, I absorb them, I merge with identities. And there the struggle comes from. And it's a gradual process of first realizing what false identities do I have and gradually move toward the real identity. And that's not being done in a few weeks or a month, you know, or like by simply reading the Bhagavatam. It's 
supplying process, uh, applying the process and gradually getting there. Constant introspection is something you're supposed to do. You have over and over again contemplate. It's not like simply speculating theoretically. Contemplating is like trying to create awareness, observe and become an observer of mind and senses as well, of, of, of the body, and learn to, to perceive the difference, practically sharpen our sense of perception. You know, by also a certain lifestyle, you know, keeping our mind focused, clean, pure, our body and so on, simple living, high thinking, so this principle. So here the purport, Sri Prabhupada further like, points out like, um, how one should not foolishly jump to Rasa Lila, for example, the uh, higher pastimes of Krishna without being actually liberated. He says clearly in the purport that his pastimes of Krishna and Vrindavan, sometimes he, not just the Rasa Lila, he speaks about generally even Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, are meant for those who are actually on the liberated platform because they can fully appreciate what's happening there. And um, then maybe yes. We'll come in another part because we don't read all the purports. But this is a very significant verse I find, 2753 in the purport, it's a bit longer. So we'll move on because time, to, to track of time. That's one thing in the material world. Always the time factor is breathing down our necks. It's, <laughs> it's no eternity and you can relax, no time is there. So it's an interesting expression the tooth of time is, how do say, not, I mean, how do you say this in English? Nine, yeah, on everyone, you know. Um, so, in the second canto, um, Shri, uh, Par uh, Parikshit Maharaj is inquiring about this particular pastime, the Shishtilida, in the fourth chapter. And Shri Prabhupada makes very significant points in the purpose. Here in um, 246, Prabhupada writes, Marj Parishya did not ask his spiritual master Shukadev Goswami to narrate about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. He wanted to hear first about the creation of the Lord. Shukadev Goswami did not say that the king should hear about the direct transcendental pastimes of the Lord. The time was very short, and naturally Shukadev Goswami could have gone directly to the 10th canto to make a shortcut of the whole thing, as generally done by the professional residers. But neither the king nor the great speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam jumped up like the, organized, the organizers of Bhagavatam. Both of them proceeded systematically so that both future readers and hearers might take lessons from the example of the procedure of reciting Srimad Bhagavatam. Here again he says, those who are under, are under the control of the external energy of the Lord or in other words, those who are in the material world must first of all know the external energy of the Lord, how it is working under the direction, under the direction of the Supreme Personality, and afterwards one might try to enter into the activities of his internal energy. Again, the same point. Stressed. Which pastime is fit? Because for, for what audience, you know, for Krishna all the pastimes are equally, we will hear that, that for him, um, there's no difference on a transcendent level. All his activities are transcendental pastimes, also the act of creation. According to the re recipient, though, of the pastime, this might look a bit different. One might be higher, lower, and yes, I will share with you another verse. Then in 2.4.10, um, In the end of the purpose, Shri Prabhupada writes, The Lord's pastimes in the, in the internal potency are displayed in his activities in Vrindavan, but the workings of his external potency are directed in his features of Karanar, Navashya Vishnu, Gavudakashya Vishnu, and Kshirudakashya Vishnu. Shira Vishwanath Chakravati offers his good counsel to the interested Vaishnavas when he says that they should not be interested in hearing only about the Lord's activities like Rasa Lila, but must be keenly interested in his pastimes, in his features of the Purusha avatars, in connection with Shri Tattva, creational functions, following the examples of Maharaj Parikshit, the ideal disciple, and Shubhadev Goswami, the ideal spiritual master. So, very instructive. 
Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakur is, I like the phrase, and gives his good counsel to the interested Vaishnavas, saying, um, he is directing us, saying, you should develop an interest in that. Right? There's nothing wrong or nothing, um, how to say, unnecessary about that pastime. No, it's actually, obviously, when we hear that, it's emphasized drastically. If you read first, second canto, it's, um, it's there a lot. And I personally find it's a, it's a wonderful, fascinating pastime. There's so much to be amazed about and so much to be, um, I would say, um, so many things that might be, be really interesting for you and give you a, a better connection to yourself and the Lord because it, like, it addresses where we are at in our conditioned state. And the more we get a sense of what is happening, why and how, what is my relationship to all that, the more it becomes relevant for me. Right? Sometimes in spiritual life you might find if you hear, some people have this experience certain pastimes or, like, or hear certain topics and wonder at the end, how is it relevant for me right now? You know? So but this pastime is very relevant because um, we are, as, as we said before already, um, in a conditioned state and we daily experience the interactions of matter um, on ourselves. So, and I will end with the last quote where Sri Prabhupada also points out it's not, um, how to say now, a burden put on you. You should just uh, read this pastime and study and it is forbidden to hear about the others. It's actually not in that sense forbidden. Of course, Krishna, uh, Prabhupada, interestingly, the first, well, practically more or less, the first book he gave out is what? It's the Krishna book, right? It's the pastimes of the Ten Canto. Why? Because he says that's still essentially that's what Krishna is about, and we should know about that, of course. It's not that we should be ignorant about the pastimes of Krishna and at the same time say, yeah, Krishna. <laughs> but what about him and his pastimes? No, we don't hear about that. <laughs> even in the, even in the, in the int introduction of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Prabhupada talks about the five primary rasas. Shortly, introductory, he says they exist, and one should be aware that they exist, and not act like, oh no, no, no one is qualified to hear about it. It's mainly also about the speaker. He said if the speaker is qualified, coming from pure platform, the audience benefits. But also, of course, the audience must be qualified, but there's more emphasis actually on the speaker than on the, on the audience. And in the Sri Prabhupada Dilamrita, it's explained how Prabhupada, in, in rather the early days in front of ISKCON, there's some descriptions how he was um, in some Vaishnava families in India, stayed there for a while, and there was once a couple. And of course, they inquired from him, please tell us about the pastimes of Radha Krishna, and so on, and he refused. Or like he tried to politely avoid it. And they insisted. And, and first he, come, he came from the point of, um, no, this is meant for liberated persons. And talk about that. And when the further insisted, he made an interesting move. He said, I'm not qualified to speak about it. Which is, I uh, find a, an interesting approach. You know, first he said, okay, actually, you know, you're not qualified to hear about it. <laughs> and he said, and they insisted, he said, I'm not qualified to speak about it. It's, I find it uh, was sweet, you know, the, the way he choose, chose to deal with that. Um, and here, he also points out it's not because sometimes the impression is that it's also what we hear in 2753 that people think ah the other stuff is kind of boring the real juice is there in the pastimes of Krishna or whatever in the Tenkanto or whatever but here in um, 2424 at the end of the purport your prophet says the pure devotees of the Lord, however, can equally relish the nectar in the form of profound philosophical discourses relating to, for example, the Shrishti Lila, and in the form of kissing by the Lord in the Rasa dance, as there is no mundane distinction between the two. This statement struck me first time I heard it. So he's saying, like, the pure devotees enjoy equally when they have profound philosophical discussions about might be Sankhya philosophy, equally as, you know, would being, being kissed by Krishna in the Rasa dance, being gopi, which is very confidential and uh, um, esoteric. 
So pointing out, there's the same transcendental Krishna, same transcendental pastime. So for one fast pastime, I would be fit for the other not. <laughs> that, that's, simply, that, that's the difference. There's no difference in pastime, it's a difference of what we say adhikar. So as the, back, back to the verse, um, the verse is encouraging, um, because here we are in the fourth canto, for example, this narration makes you successful in your attempts of conquest. If you are a king, um, you might be able to rule over the world. So what we talked about, if you use Bhagavatam in the proper way, the proper um, methodology, we might be able to conquer our own um, ignorance in terms of moving toward self-realization, you know, becoming purified and conquer the lower modes and rise to the higher modes. Hare Krishna. I will open here for comments and questions. Thank you, Guru. I was just wondering on this point of sometimes we hear that Krishna Kata is so important and so how do we understand Krishna Kata? Is it just the pastimes or is it everything and but as I understand these exalted Vaishnavas like for example Goku in the Marachi was always speaking about of pastimes because that's what Krishna Kata actually means. So how how do we mm -hmm. in, in connection to yeah hearing about philosophy and Mm -hmm. Sri Prabhupada used to um, state as one example of Krishna Katha the conversation of Krishna and Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Katha means of course like it's it's narration. I think by the word it's kind of narration, telling about, you know, talking about. Um, this is one of Krishna's activities. He for example instructs Arjuna. That's one of Krishna's pastimes. The Bhagavad Gita practically is a pastime. Right? And hearing about what Krishna says, discussing what Krishna says, um, is also Krishna Katha. But it aims at a different direction, perhaps it aims about more philosophical understanding, whereas other pastimes might aim at relishing Krishna's activities. Um, even the Srimad Bhagavatam, also the 11th canto, is, is also filled quite a lot where Krishna speaks philosophy, where he instructs Uddhava, for example. Whereas when we hear of the different Dashavatars, we um, hear narrations that maybe more like allow us to envision Krishna in his different forms and what he does and be amazed and be attracted. Because, yes, this is what, what he in, intends, uh, attracts the living entities. So, Kata can mean both things, simply hearing the pastimes, the activities for the sake of transcendental relishment, develop an attraction. But kata also means philosophical discourse in terms of speaking about what does Krishna say. Or like Kapila Dev, he instructs his mother on Sankhya philosophy, very technical and also at times very abstract themes. But it's also Krishna kata. Is that answering your question? So you would say both is equally potent? Yes. It's like here, like have you heard in the purport, purport saying it's all activities of Krishna are on a transcendental platform and for him also equally transcendent. Of course, on a, on a certain level, we hear, um, if you talk of the rasas, there are pastimes that involve more rasas or higher levels of rasas. So on, on that level, on a transcendental platform, there can be distinctions of how sweet is a pastime in regards to how much it is filled with opulence and r respect and where there's not too much intimacy comparatively. Yes, then we can say there are of course distinctions within that, but otherwise um, Krishna is always the same transcendent Krishna, even if he um, performs his pastime with the material energy or external energy. I think this is what Prabhupada points out in all his purports to don't make an artificial distinction saying this is just material and not really something spiritual, but the other thing is. Krishna does nothing unspiritual. It's not possible. Everything Krishna does is spiritual transcendent. And this is an important distinction we should uh, make, that we don't mistake the pastime related to material energy as not so spiritually potent as what happens in the in Goloka Vrindavan, for example.
तना प्रदेश बसने की जाए सी कौर अंता की One is relating to something technical because I was discussing with the devotee uh, in this section of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. If we go to text 31 of the same chapter, there they again in this uh, Falashruti they talk about how if you listen to the pastimes of Prithamaraj, you reach the same planet as him. And then suddenly it talks about if you read it, you have as a Kshatriya you gain this, or then it kind of it comes mundane and then again goes into going back to Godhead. So mm-hmm. if you had any insight why there is this flow that's first they talk about reaching the high mm-hmm. planet and then suddenly it comes down to this materialistic platform and then again. Uh, I must say I'm not now familiar with the section. Mm-hmm. So far a general understanding I have about also maybe from some of our audience they can comment on that is that also people are differently addressed in the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam addresses different people on different platforms and to see what might co- catch their attention better or their interest. So might, there might be, um, it might be an, um, I forgot the English word, an um, incentive, incentive, something for, for that. Like if they hear like, oh, that has a benefit even within to your frame, whereas others feel like I'm interested only in the spiritual benefit. But both seek benefits, and if you can get whatever the people, if you can get the fish on the hook with the other, <laughs> you get this. So that's kind of okay. That's my guess or understanding on that, but maybe someone um, might also comment on that. Because at the end, if you end up chanting Prismarja's pastimes, mission fulfilled, or? Three times. <laughs> mm-hmm. Go ahead with the second question. <clears throat> because um, you, you spoke about uh, this body in a way also being sort of Shetra and conquering of the body. And I was just discussing with the devotee yesterday that this term uh, Shasta Chakshu is so potent that if we see even our own experiences or whatever is around us through the lens of knowledge then there is no uh, reason to be despaired or then nothing would actually matter or even hurt us Mm -hmm. in a way but then I was thinking although sometimes I mean on a personal level if I look into my mind um, when I think of it as there is this, I could say, not fully developed, but some kind of Shasta Chakshu, where I study the situation and I realize also. And, but at the same time, yeah, you do have these emotions also at the same time. So for me, it's sometimes it's very bewildering because knowledge is so powerful. Mm-hmm. But why is it that there is this limitation that although you have the knowledge and you realize aspects of the knowledge which help you mm-hmm. overcome these trivial emotions or whatever, but it's still not possible. So maybe you could shed some light on mm-hmm. why we have such kind of limitations. I mean, if you absor- absorb knowledge, um, I think it would be a misconception to think simply I have, because I've absorbed some of it, um, it automatically makes, so to say, my condition go away. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to deal with, so to say, the condition anymore. My understanding is, if it's, if it's there, like, you can consider it like an equipment you get. If you have absorbed knowledge, and like, like Kshakra, he's equipped with a weapon. But what is he supposed to use? It? The weapon alone doesn't, doesn't do the fight. So, if you have the knowledge then, and you, I think that we are challenged or prompted and wanted to then apply it, and still deal with the things we got to deal with, through the perception of knowledge. And we, we still might have to go through our whatever material emotions and um, mental challenges just with a different perspective mm-hmm. but it's 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 still ahead of us but we have a different equipment that's how i understand with, with the knowledge of course a deep realization a spiritual realization can also relieve you from from a certain ignorance that certain conditions will disappear because now it, 
by the power of consciousness, you dissolve the certain ignorance that made you, you know, otherwise enter certain patterns of behavior, for example. So, but usually it is you have to kind of work through by becoming gradually conscious and with certain knowledge then that, that you learn to respond differently in situations through the knowledge you gather. But still you have to apply the knowledge in processes, interactions, or we let me say personal transformation. Is this answering? All right. Any more comments, questions? Oh, they also. Is that it? Hare. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the class. Um, uh, you know, it's very it's important. You know, to understand the point that. Um, like, uh, you know, that past time where Ram went to the forest and then he made the sadhus and they want to marry him and now we can, nice life. Mm -hmm. and so they were sadhus, they have uh, all the understanding of the universe and the creation and all this. And also the gopis, they, you know, they, this, uh, they have full knowledge of that. It's a yoga maja that cover them, so it's not difference. It's just that clear comment. Thank you. Sure. I had a question I want to ask Dr. Christian. He was here yesterday, but we didn't have much time. So because he was saying how um, Bhagavatam, hearing Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, everything is there. We don't need anything else. Everything that is possibly to be known is in the Bhagavatam. So then on a practical level, what does it mean, for example, you know, <laughs> somebody might ask, so how can I now build a house if I read Bhagavatam? You know, something like that. How do we understand this? Mm -hmm. How can I explain it? I mean, if you, if you say everything is there, then of course I come from a certain perspective of what do I need to know? Um, of course, in the Bhagavatam, there, there are ten, ten big topics mentioned, like, and quite a few address actually the creation. So. <laughs> Just, <laughs> um, and the kings and so on, the Simon Bono, the absolute truth. So, in regards, whatever you need to develop spiritually, it's there. Um, and of course, it doesn't tell you how to fix your iPhone and, and whatever, you know, or how to build a house, as you say. But it gives you the overall perspective on life, on the world, that is required in order to deal in the best, how to say, spiritual or sattvic way with what comes your way in this life. So I would see it from in this way. Bhagavatam gives you everything you need to develop spiritually or properly. It gives you all the knowledge. It's interesting, your Prabhupada gives also um, a concrete percentage of how much the jiva or the soul can know about God. It's 78% of all the possible knowledge. Um, I have to quote some. Uh, um, so, of course, f there is things we are supposed to know, and mainly what we are supposed to know is like, what is my spiritual identity and, and my relationship with Krishna, and the relationship to the world, Sambandha Gyan, as we call it. And this is all there. All the knowledge that, that matters for our spiritual development is there. That's what I would also say. And also Gold Windeswami, he said he made it also one of his missions, he says, because you I think you mentioned it before. Um, I want to convince them or make or like prove them wrong when they say there's not everything is in Prabhupada's books. Yes, everything is there, not just ABC. And he was also convinced, yeah, everything is there. And if you truly read it, yeah, it's so rich. And everything you got to know, what you also can understand, is there. And at the end, if you really work with the Bhagavatam or with the process of Bhakti Yoga, anyway, the end, that what we aim for, let's say, outside of that, is usually something that needs to be revealed. 
it's not necessarily have to, has to be written in another book. It's something where you have to work for in order to realize it. You know, simply a mantra, like for those who are second initiated, they get the Gayatri mantras. And if you study a bit about what these mantras are, simply the syllable klim is said a bija mantra, a seed mantra, which is potentially be able to f fulfill all desires. And in Brahma Samhita, um, in the purports, your Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur um, explains, or actually the original purport is from Jiva Jiva Goswami, which later was also, uh, has been, um, I say, expanded or worked with by Bhakti Muttaku and then Bhakti Saraswati Thakur wrote it, and says that actually this mantra is also supposed to um, nurture the spiritual desires of the Jiva, that they develop desires in relationship to Krishna. So by chanting these mantras, by the forms of Krishna. So this is this is all there, that's what you need. This is then you are successful. If you end up at the end of the day and you feel I have a desire to link with Krishna, to serve him a certain way, or somehow or other my mind is eager to contemplate Krishna, then you're successful spiritually. This is one of our benchmarks. How much am I truly heartfelt interested in thinking and speaking of Krishna, doing something for Krishna? And another benchmark is, okay, how much does my lust, greed, anger, and so on decrease my attachment? So, yeah. This is... Yeah, thank you. Just reflecting back, so it's kind of... Because everything spiritual is there, then also all material things are taken care of. Is that also a side effect of it? Or like everything we need to know, we get to know from, from there. Essentially, I would, uh, would say again, for um, a, a principle is applied in the Bhagavatam. If you would only have the shlokas, you would not understand so much. But we have purports from different acharyas, because also according to time and circumstances, um, we need that, or we don't have, we naturally don't, we don't have the cultural context, for example. So it's important. So for other things also, we might need additional um, input or information that this fits our time and circumstances that makes us help to put things into perspective. Um, personally, when we talk about dealing with the mind, for example, of course we have a lot of valuable instructions. I personally, my experience is like, okay, but with this, what, what was being figured out in the last century, also by people either based on or related to spiritual scriptures or not at all, is very important, relevant, and can be helpful in our spiritual life. But it's not explicitly written in the Shastra. So I think one it should not lead to being narrow. I think it's it's a, the point when, when we hear about everything in the Bhagavatam, I think it's about having conviction and faith. You you are sufficiently equipped with that for spiritual life. It's not that you lack something if you have only that. I mean only it's ten cantos. I mean <laughs> really study through it first and then and then really um, hardly I think hardly anyone could say who truly reads the full Bhagavatam saying there's this is just not enough. Well, okay, maybe. <laughs> for me, no. For me, it's definitely like everything is there. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, could we also use the principal dating perspective? That actually, mm -hmm. just I was thinking that perhaps we could also use this principal and detailed perspective. That in Shima, what, what perspective? Principal and detailed perspective. I like didn't understand the word, I'm sorry. Principle. Yeah, principle, the what? Details. The details. 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 Yeah. Yes. Ah, I'm sorry, didn't, okay. Details. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, this perspective that uh, Srimad Bhagavatam and the other texts, they give you the principles and the essential uh -huh. principles that you need to survive or thrive as a soul or even mm -hmm. a person. And the details are something you figure out eventually. Yeah, I think it's both. Sometimes you have very important details also, you know, and uh, there are quite some really concrete, particular things that take in your life. But otherwise, yeah, also principles are there, and yeah, and some things we got to figure out, and sometimes maybe we get from another source as well. But essentially, all is there. Granta Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.